Well, this is uh, really exciting to see a full crowd tonight, and I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, as she said, I'm in, uh, a, a research faculty member in the Department of Energy, Environmental, and Chemical Engineering, uh, although my background is actually in mechanical engineering. Um, and, and since um, about 10, 15 years ago, I've been studying uh, combustion, right? So I'm a combustion engineer. We still, for our energy needs, we still depend largely on combustion. Over 90% of our energy comes from burning things, whether it be fossil fuels or wood, biomass. Uh, and so combustion is a very important part of our lives. And, and what, I, what I do at the university is explore ways to rethink the combustion process so that we can start to deal with a changing uh, climate. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Um, it's, this is a very timely discussion. I don't know if the planners had thought that, that uh, far ahead because, you know, right ongoing right now in, in Paris, uh, are the uh, the climate talks? All the nations are in Paris discussing uh, various strategies in which we might uh, drastically change our energy infrastructure, uh, switching from a you know a high greenhouse gas output kind of energy structure to a low carbon uh, energy future, which would require an enormous uh, investment and enormous planning between all of the countries of the world because CO2 is, is obviously a global problem that requires uh, all the stakeholders come together and, and come up with ways to deal with it. And, uh, and they're discussing different strategies uh, so that we, they, we might uh, limit the change in global temperature to say two degrees uh, Celsius as recommended by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, okay? Because anything over two degrees C, there's a fear that the change in the climate might be quite dramatic and perhaps, you know, high costs, okay? Catastrophic, maybe. It was, uh, and we can debate, we can all debate, we all wonder what really the future holds. Uh, is it important to hold global temperature to two degrees C? That's an enormous debate uh, and discussion that I think we're all having and we don't really know the real answer to that. I'm not really here to debate uh, that question. I'm here to talk about different ways in which we might reach that goal of holding climate temperature uh, to two degrees C. And it will invo have to involve uh, carbon capture and, and storage, at least I think that, I hope that's what I, the take home message that I, I want to give you. Um, and so let's jump right into the talk. Um, this is just a, one a graph representing the problem in terms of CO2 emissions. So the, you know, the, this is the main greenhouse gas that we're concerned with, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has, Emissions have been on the rise. Uh, this is just recent years, since 1990. The data points are real uh, global emissions in the amount of gigatons of carbon per year. And these, these two dashed lines here represent sort of the course we would have liked to have been on in the year 2000 if we were going to meet this objective of two degrees C. Uh, that would be this, I believe, this green line here. Um, and, and these colored lines are different plans that have been proposed or policies that have been initiated. So if we had followed through with these plans, and perhaps we'd be on this course. But in actuality, we're still this red case, which is basically business as usual. Not, we're not doing anything really to have a really large impact on CO2 right now, globally. Um, I know this is not so recent, where this is only out to 2010, but I know I could look at the last few years and the story is not 
significantly different. Okay, so we're we are not at all on a path to uh, holding global temperature to two degrees C, and it's going to take a, dr a drastic change, a drastic investment to to get there. Okay. Um, this is one illustration of, of some of the issues. So here I'm looking at, and I hope those in the back can see, this is a tough one to read, uh, greenhouse gas emissions per person in various parts of the world, okay? Uh, so here you see uh, the United States, and I've updated this plot recently, so you'll see uh, this is actually an, an older plot. You can't see the source here. This is from a book called um, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air by David uh, McKay. And this is actually a fantastic book. I recommend everyone read it. Uh, the data in it was a little, a little old, so I updated it a little bit here. So now we're looking at the United States um, as actually... Uh, decreased from when this graph was produced. So this is more recent. We're at about 17 and a half uh, CO2, tons of CO2 per person, okay, which is higher per capita than many other parts of the world. So we notice right away that there's a large opportunity here in the United States to, to uh, reduce our carbon footprint. If we look at other uh, uh, modern uh, or well-developed countries, so say in Europe, you see they, they have a, an energy infrastructure that allows them to have lower CO2 emissions per person. Um, but but these, are, these are well developed countries, they live, people are living very comfortable lives, right? So we can sort of, you know, we can sort of suggest that, you know, this, this area of, you know, 10 or below tons per CO2 per person is what we need today to really live a a uh, modern uh, lifestyle with all the technology that comes with that. If we look, if we go out here to to Asia, um, we see a couple things, and I've updated China here. So China is actually up here at about six uh, per person now. And we look at India. We look at the, where all of the people are, <laughs> right? Uh, they they have lower. And it's not because they are so much more efficient than us or are using greener technologies. It's just because very few, there's a much smaller fraction of the population that has access to regular electricity. Okay. So, so this illustrates the problem. As, as, we, as, we, as we bring electricity and, and vehicles and all the things that we have, uh, as all those come into play for everybody in the world, CO2 emissions are going to, you know, these, these numbers are going to come up here, right? And you look at the, the total problem is how much CO2. So you add up all the boxes, right? And you see, wow, if we, if we allow all of these people to uh, have energy, but we don't change the technology, Right? If they use the same technology we use, the emissions are going to come up to here. And that's an enormous amount of CO2. Right? So that's the, that's the, these are some of the biggest challenges. We have, to get, we have to provide electricity and energy to people who don't have access. And we have to obviously re reduce our, improve our efficiency uh, here. Okay. This is a, um, a little story about uh, Carnot. So Carnot is a, is a famous uh, French scientist, sort of the, we call him one of the fathers of modern thermodynamics. I don't know if anybody heard of a Carnot cycle. Um, so, you know, Carnot was some of the, one of the first to really realize the power that, that combustion can really uh, provide. Okay, and this was early, it's a very early at the very beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. And so here's what he's saying, nature is providing us with combustibles on all sides. He's given us the power to produce at all times and in all places heat and the impelling power which is the result of it. 
So these engines seem destined to produce a great revolution in the civilized world. And he was absolutely right. This was, the, again, the beginning of the, the Industrial Revolution. People had, were able, because of the controlling combustion and, and finding a, a, a source of fuels in, in wood and later coal and then later than that gas, um, it just enabled people to accomplish uh, many things and keep them warm, energy to make medicine, so, so uh, uh, you know, people started living a much longer, uh, healthier lives because of energy. Whoops. But he goes on to say, and then we look at what they had for energy before, right? So these combustibles, they can be substituted for animal power, waterfalls, air currents, right? Over the first of these motors, it has the advantage of economy, right? Costs a lot of money to grow food to feed an animal, okay? And the other two, it has the inestim inestimable advantage that it can be used at all times and places without interruption, okay? So he's highlighting very early on the problem with renewable energy, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, before, you had to depend on the wind blowing or the current in the river to drive a, a you know, a, a turbine. Uh, combustibles gives us the, the chance to use the energy whenever we need it. Now it's a very important step. So, and he, he highlights a few important things, right? If you have these things, it's, it's, he's, he's sort of saying, look, the, the energy, you want this energy source to be secure, right? I want to have the energy available to me when I, when I need it. I need it to be affordable, right? Cheap energy, we live in an age right now, it's an amazing time, that some of the cheapest energy we'll, we have seen or will ever see. Uh, and that enables us to go places, do things, make, you know, make products at, at low costs. And, and, and by the way, heat our, keep our uh, houses warm and and, and everything else. So we, you know, ener energy enables everything. So you want to keep it affordable so we don't limit our ability to accomplish things in life. We need it to be reliable and with minimal impact on the environment. These are the things that I see are important to any energy source uh, going forward. This is sort of an, uh, a, a nice graph illustrating where, how we all use energy, okay? so. Our CO2 footprint, where does it come from? This is sort of where it comes from, right? Each of us needs, a typical US person needs somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 and let's say 20 kilowatt hours per person per day. That's how much energy we, that's how much energy we use, let's say, okay? Some of that is in our food. Right? We actually we really need the, the minimum energy we need, we need to put in our bodies to keep it going. So this is our this is the energy associated with our diet. We have a, a lot of the energy that, that we all use is embodied in all the stuff that's around us. Making all the chairs, the computers, uh, our clothing. These all require and you see that's a large fraction of all the energy that we use. It's all the stuff around us that we, that we use that requires so much energy. Um, flying, you know, air travel takes a very high amount of energy. Down here is heating and electricity. So this is basically our homes, okay? And, people, and we think about, boy, we, we, if we just switch to uh, renewable energy, if I put a solar panel on my house or I switch to geothermal energy on my house, I can make, um, you know, I can be carbon neutral. Well, you can make a very important contribution and you can lower your carbon emissions, but it doesn't, you know, putting a solar panel on your house doesn't get you places, it doesn't make things for you. Uh, there's just a lot of other energy that you need besides that solar panel on your roof to survive. And then finally, down here is is cars. So we 
you know, I'm able to come to you and talk to you today because it's easy for me to hop in a car and, and uh, we can, it's not just we need energy to live and eat, you know, we need energy, we want energy to get around. We have the freedom to go wherever we want and do whatever we want, okay? And that's not a lifestyle I think anybody wants to give up. And so we're looking for low carbon solutions that still allows us to move around. And that's a huge, huge challenge. I'm focusing today more on the electricity. So that's, that's you know, electricity needed to make things, electricity needed to, uh, for your home, to charge devices and, and run your air conditionings, et cetera, right? So we're looking at stationary power because it's very hard to capture carbon dioxide from moving objects. We're not gonna capture carbon dioxide from airplanes and cars, but we're gonna look to stationary power uh, sources and understand how we might capture the carbon dioxide from that. Okay, um, here's just a look at sort of the status of, of where we are in terms of electricity production. So the size of the pie sort of tells you how much electricity, uh, the blue tells you how much that electricity came from coal. So in 2010 in the U.S. we're about 41 percent, that number is going down. Uh, and in the United States, we're, we're in a, a fuel switching mode where we're decreasing the amount of coal use and increasing the amount of gas, which is in the gray here. Uh, but both, both coal and gas both emit carbon dioxide. So you can see a, a healthy chunk of our electricity portfolio you know, results in CO2 emissions right now. Uh, the red is nuclear, so we consider nuclear energy to be carbon uh, free, or carbon neutral. So that's a very positive thing about nuclear. Uh, the yellow or gold, here's our renewables. And this is, in this country, it's mostly hydroelectric, um, which is about, so now it's about 20% uh, of our electricity right now comes from renewable energy. And again, most of that is uh, hydroelectric. If we can see in China, you know, over 75% of the electricity comes from burning coal, right? So here's where a lot of the a bulk of the CO2 emissions from electricity is coming from. And these are relatively new plants, so they're gonna live with these for a while. Uh, so where are we going in the world with respect to energy, um, or electricity in specific, or specifically? So here's just a, a quick chart of where where we're headed in terms of electricity. Here's where we were in 73 and 2010, and it's projected in 2035, we're gonna need another 70% increase in electricity demand in the world, okay? So there's, again, it's, it's Asia, there's a huge demand for electricity. Um, and the world population is growing, okay? So we, we need, we will require more energy, which will require increases in all of our energy sources, okay? So in this chart here, you've got the fuel source broken down, and over each fuel source, we have the years 73, 2010, and projected 2035. This is all coming from the uh, International Energy Agency, okay? So here you see the total coal use, for example, going up. We're increasing the amount of coal we're gonna be using. Now the, the fraction, the share, will be probably going down. We'll use 33% as opposed to 41. And of course these are just projections, who knows, but uh, it's quite very, very reasonable. The fraction of coal use will go down, but the total will go up because we need more energy. Oil is, is, you know, we're fading out oil for electricity worldwide, so that will approach to near zero. Natural gas is drastically increasing in the U.S., and it will probably take off in other parts of the world. Uh, we projected increases in nuclear. We need more hydro. And here's other. Other is bioenergy, wind, geothermal, solar, all of our renewables. All of our renewables worldwide today, or it, uh, today counts for roughly 4% of, of uh, global electricity. 
and with a massive investment uh, that can be taken up. We've, it's projected that uh, we can, it will drastically increase, right? We're talking about a, almost a tenfold increase by 2035, which might take us to a 16% renewable uh, share, right? So, yes, huge growth in renewables, but look at the overall picture, still very heavy in uh, fossil fuels, right? So, you know, the, one of the points I'm trying to make is that, you know, it's, 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 it's very easy and it's, uh, we all, my, my message is not always so cheerful. I hope you guys weren't uh, coming to have a good laugh and, and uh, uh, it's, we all want to say, just, just leave the fossil fuels in the ground, don't use them. And that will solve the problem, right? We won't have global warming anywhere, we we'll just won't dig up the fuels. Um, we, we see how un unreasonable that, that is, that you, you can't grow renewables fast enough and you can't shut off energy to people. Uh, and so that's, while we, we wish we could just leave them in the ground, all, all data from all agencies suggest it's just not going to happen. We, have, we require fossil fuels to meet our energy demands. Therefore, if we need to do something about carbon dioxide, we better figure out how to collect that stuff and not let it go into the atmosphere. Here's a little graph on cost. This I took from a, a, a Bloomberg article. This just shows the cost of different technologies. There's a lot of uncertainty here, but the bottom line is, you know, uh, you see coal, you see gas, you see hydroelectric, uh, you see onshore wind, a little more expensive. So these are all at roughly the same uh, costs. But as we go to biomass, we go to photovoltaics, so these are solar, all the different solar technologies, the cost is drastically increasing. So when we get out here, we're talking about at least doubling, maybe tripling the cost of electricity. Um, which is not something we want to do. Uh, so we're and and in terms of carbon capture, we look at this very very carefully too. So how does the cost of carbon capture compare to these other uh, low carbon sources like nuclear, uh, like wind, and like and like solar? So you're looking for technologies that are in this range of a hundred dollars a megawatt hour. That would be ideal. That would be. Uh, reasonable increase in the cost of electricity, perhaps, and that's arguable whether you'd want any increase in electricity, cost of electricity, but, you know, the bottom line is if you can do carbon capture for a marginal increase in cost, you can be competitive with other renewable and, and you can be competitive with, with nuclear on, uh, economically and have all the benefits that come with the fossil fuels, meaning you can use them whenever you want them. We, we have a lot of fossil fuels. I'll get into that next, I think. I'm not sure what's happening. I see, okay. Um, I, should look at, I should look here, then I know what's coming. Um, here's another issue with renewables, and I don't mean to bash renewables. I'm just trying to make sure we're grounded in reality a bit. Renewables have a a, a huge impact on our environment as well. Yes, they're lower in carbon, but you know, this is examples of some lo large solar installations. Like I said, putting a solar panel on your roofs is great, but it doesn't give us everything we need. We're gonna need very large power plants, uh, uh, solar and wind to, to provide all of the electricity we need. So, you know, these are just examples of, just to say that these are very large installations. Uh, they take up a lot of lands. Renewable energy is diffuse. It's not concentrated like, like coal, like a chemical energy is. So, uh, you know, this is an example of a solar uh, installation. It's using uh, mirrors and focusing light here at the tower in the center and heating up a, you know, a hot salt or making steam, driving a turbine, et cetera. Um, it's just, uh, and that you can't get that land back. You need that electricity, so that land is gone, right? And and you have to 
keep these mirrors especially clean. You can't have dust on them. So you got it takes a lot of water to wash the dirt off of these mirrors. Keep them clean. Uh, with the wind turbines, here's a series of wind turbines on mountaintops in Appalachia. You can't use, you can't uh, go visit these mountains now. They're, who wants to stand under wind turbines, right? And uh, and you get a pitiful amount of electricity out of them uh, compared to coal. So we make a we make a choice, you know, when we go to re large scale renewable, um, that um, you know could have impacts. We, we really, you know, the choices we make in terms of land use are are quite important. Um, and I'll also, you know, point out, yeah, each wind turbine requires 260 tons of steel, okay? This is according to the World Coal Association, bear in mind. Each wind turbine requires 260 tons of steel, okay? That you, to make steel, you need 170 tons of coking coal, right? So you've got all, these, all the coal and CO2 emissions associated with just making one of these wind turbines, okay? So renewables is important. Renewables is is not the only. It's not the silver bullet. It's part of the. It's part of the puzzle. It's part of the part of the solution. And if we depended only on renewable, our entire landscape would be littered with these. Uh, the other issue is that they're intermittent. Uh, so this is a, a, an extreme example, but a real example, right? So this is data from uh, Texas, where we have a lot of. Uh, wind energy installed and and it's, it's in use in in and I'm going to show you the green line which is a daily uh, energy electricity demand in this part of Texas in this part of Texas it gets very hot during the day it cools off at night so you see every day the AC people turning on their air conditioning demand ramps up uh, when it cools off at night demand goes down Etc. You see this cycle. People wake up in the morning. They turn on their lights. Okay, it's getting warm. Turn on the AC. Up, down, up, down every day. Right. It also happens in this part of Texas. The wind doesn't really blow during the day. It only blows at night. So the blue is the wind, the output of the wind turbine. When just when you need power the most, your wind turbine is providing the the least amount of power. Right. And this happens. This happened for that week. It, there's examples of this all over the country. You can uh, you can actually go to the, the what's called the MISO the MISO uh, website and look. Uh, this is a this is an energy grid, um, and you can see in real time how much the wind turbines are producing in real time. You can see the price of electricity. So it's sort of a fun exercise. Um, but the point is, there's, I mean, there's examples where you have a negative pricing situation where in the middle of the night, you get a big gust of wind um, and there's no demand for that electricity. And so the, the generator is actually, the owner of the wind farm <clears throat> is actually paying the grid operator to take that electricity. It has a negative value. Um, and there are ex exa examples of this. So we, integrating renewables at, an ex, at a large scale can be quite challenging because the energy comes whenever the wind blows. With solar, it's you're depending on the sun, okay? Um, and it's fine if you're supplementing the grid with renewable energy, but if you're going all the way to talk about replacing all the other sources of energy with renewables, that's a, a whole other challenge altogether because not only do you have to, you, cause, because our demand changes. And so you always have to produce 10 times as much, I'm just throwing out a number here, let's say 10 times as much electricity as any, that you're using at any one time so that you can store it and, and use it at, at a time when, you, when the wind isn't blowing. And those storage systems don't, don't really exist at the large scale, and they're extremely expensive. And so we can most definitely talk about supplementing the grid with, with renewable energy, and we can find clever ways to deal with this. We can start to introduce storage, but replacing baseload power from fossil is an entirely different task, and, and I would say it's quite unreasonable. 
Okay, so, and the world's, and in many parts of the world, they think using renewable energy is, is not the best way to get started. So here's an example of that. Here's the proposed coal-fired power plants in the world. China's built many of these already. India has visions of building an enormous amount of coal-fired power plants to supply electricity to its people. Um, and so if, we, if this were to happen without any carbon capture, um, that's a lot of carbon dioxide and we're never going to get uh, come close to meeting our, our goals. So why do we, why, what, what are some other, uh, we'll talk about some other positives of, of coal. Uh, you know, we, we, and here in the United States we have uh, more coal than any other country of the world. Here's where it is. Uh, you see uh, where it is isn't so important. It's, it's, a, it's everywhere in the U.S. It's available to us. It comes in different ranks and different qualities. In Missouri, it turns out that a lot of the coal we burn comes from uh, this part of Wyoming because uh, that's lower sulfur coal. Um, anyway, we have, we have a lot of it. We can dig it up whenever we need it. We can last, you know, we're talking about at least 200 years of coal reserves sitting in the ground in the United States. It's the largest uh, reserve of fossil fuel in the, in the world that we know of. Um, and into, I talk about land impact, you know, this, this is what an extremely large coal mine looks like, coal mining operation in Wyoming looks like, very heavy machinery. You know, I take this, this sliver, which is, you know, just to represent the section of Wyoming where this very large, thick coal seam exists that's very near the surface. Um, and there's a little red dot there, which you can't see which is roughly six square miles. That's the size of the area mined in the Powder River Basin, which is supplying over 40% of America's coal. That's 20% of the U.S. power. So that's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a small fraction of land disturbance for a huge amount of energy. And when you dig the coal up, you, put, you, you can reclaim the land, right? You, you cover up the hole and plant some trees and, or leave it open if you're grazing cattle and, and uh, you know that land has purpose again. Uh, what's in coal? This is Wyoming coal, different scene, but similar. So coal has a, you know, it's water. Uh, we're interested in it as a fuel. So if I'm, I'm looking at as two kinds of fuel, it has carbon, fixed carbon. So like the uh, char, so this is carbon that's embedded as, as a solid, and it has volatile matter or volatile fuel, so when the coal heats up, some, some gases come off and those, are, those can be burned, and those are the, the two sort of sources of fuel. And then it has some fraction, this is low ash coal, something normally something like 10% um, ash, so these are the, the minerals that are in the coal that don't, don't combust, okay? And they're mostly thing. Uh, I'll show you a composition of that uh, next. So, if if I break all this down into its elements, okay. If I take the water and the ash out, as we see, it's mostly carbon, uh, some hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, a little sulfur, and oxygen. Okay. So what I'm thinking about as a fuel, and this is why the CO2 footprint of coal is so high. Uh, it's high excuse me, high ratio of carbon to hydrogen uh, in, in coal. Natural gas has more hydrogen, uh, and so it has a lower CO2 footprint when you burn it. What else is in coal? So when you, if you look at the ash, the minerals that are left after you burn it, you see a lot of things like silicon, aluminum, titanium, iron, okay, sand, if you want to call it sand. Um, and then we, since we've dug it out on the ground, it's going to be, we're going to find some trace elements too, and some of these are, are, are quite bad for the environment. We look at things like arsenic, cadmium, chromium, nickel, mercury, lead. If, if you know the periodic table, has everybody seen the periodic table? Uh, some people like to say that studying coal is fun because it's got every element in the periodic table in it. Um, and so 
so we, we, we recognize that, right? We have to manage these things so these aren't released into the environment. Um, when you burn coal, if you, if you burn coal and let all the exhaust go into the air, these are the issues you have to deal with, right? We have to deal with sulfur oxides, right? These lead to acid rain or smog. So power, modern power plants have limestone scrubbers on them now to remove the, remove the, the sulfur and, and uh, so that the emission uh, meet safety standards that the EPA sets. Um, we have nitrogen oxides, which leads to smog, ozone. So we have different technologies like a catalytic, think of it like a catalytic converter like in your car to remove NOx, or we go to something called low NOx burners. Those fine, uh, 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 the ash often re uh, comes out as a very, very small particle, yet you have to filter out of the gas so it doesn't emit to the atmosphere. We don't want to be breathing fine particles, especially if they're enriched in heavy metals. So we have to, uh, so we have things like electrostatic precipitators and fabric filters to collect the particles. This is all existing technology. This is, um, this, is in, this, this equipment is installed on every power plant. Uh, we have new levels that were uh, new emission standards for mercury that were coming online that's been sort of on hold by the Supreme Court. But we had technologies ready to deal with mercury and activated carbon and our wet scrubbers. But the, main, the, the new one now here is CO2, right? This is what is not, we're not dealing with CO2 at, at, uh, in our coal-fired power plants right now. And so we look to carbon capture and storage to deal with that. So this is just a little bit of combustion 101. It's just a video or a photograph of coal burning in my lab. Uh, I've simplified the coal. Let's just say it's some composition of carbon and hydrogen because that's really the fuel that I'm interested in. And I burn it with air, so never mind the X and Ys. Just no air is made up of oxygen and nitrogen, okay? Air is mostly nitrogen. 79% uh, by volume nitrogen, which you know we don't use. It's the oxygen that we care about, and it's the oxygen that we need to burn the coal. When we react coal and air, we make, uh, so this breaks up, so the carbon meets the oxygen, we make carbon dioxide, that's our greenhouse gas, boo. Uh, we also make uh, water, yay. Um, you know, and and while moderate, while you know today's plants, the water vapor is just going out the stack. You see the white cloud coming out of the stack. But actually, in in uh, when we move to carbon capture, and we're thinking about uh, ultimately getting to a concentrated stream of this. Now we recover the water that's produced from combustion, and now we have actually a source of water uh, that's available to the plant. So that's a it's much more of a positive than 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 before. Okay. We have the nitrogen that just sort of came along for the ride, right? It didn't really react or do much of anything. So, eh. And then we get the heat that's released, and that's what we need to produce electricity, okay? And so what carbon capture and storage is about, what the carbon capture part of it is, is how do I separate the carbon dioxide from the rest of this stuff? And mainly I'm really looking at the nitrogen. This is, it comes out to a, a gas separation process, right? This flue gas would be about 14% carbon dioxide. The rest would be nitrogen if I burned it in air. How do I separate those two gases uh, cheaply, okay, so that I have a concentrated stream of this that I can store, okay? I don't want to store all this nitrogen, too. Um, that would be an enormous cost. So I just want to separate these two so I can only store this and let this go to the atmosphere. Okay? What do I do with the CO2? Okay, so we can dream up lots of things we could do with the CO2. Um, you could use it to grow algae. We could talk about putting energy back into CO2 and making other things with it. But in reality, we're talking about so much CO2 here that we're going to run out of uses for CO2 real quickly and we're going to need to basically store it indefinitely underground so that it doesn't go to the atmosphere. 
Okay, so we call this geologic sequestration. Here's just a cartoon of that. We're talking about 3,000 feet uh, down. Um, and in many parts of the, of the country and in the world, we find these uh, saline formations. So this is basically a, like a porous sandstone kind of geology. I'm not a geologist, so bear with me. Um, so we, so it's, it's a highly porous uh, media, and then within the pores is salt water. Okay? So the idea is you can, if you can compress carbon dioxide into a liquid, uh, it's supercritical fluid uh, and inject it in here and displace the water the same formation becomes a, a place to store uh, carbon dioxide and if you if we want to or if we need to manage the pressure we can let the water come back up and now we've got a source of water as well although it's salty so we have to get rid of the salt to, to make it useful but that's the idea okay shove it underground and just, uh, you know, and it's not a cave, it's not a big cave down here where it's, where we're storing it. It's, it's, the CO2 is trapped in very fine, in these fine pores in the, in the sandstone. Um, uh, NETL, which is the National Energy Technology Laboratory for, for the Department of Energy, produces something called a carbon sequestration atlas. So here you can see where all the possible places are to store CO2. They've mapped out uh, regions of the country. Um, these are just the saline formation. So you see, you know, I'm looking at here, I guess what we would call this the rust belt, uh, where a lot of the coal-fired power plants are in this country, is, uh, has excellent storage space under it for CO2. We look to the, 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 the southern Gulf states, uh, up here, energy states, North Dakota, Wyoming, plenty of opportunities to store carbon dioxide. There's more than enough capacity. We'll, we'll, uh, capacity is not an issue. Um, it's actually quite feasible. Sounds crazy, but it's actually quite, quite feasible. Um, we also have a lot of experience in this country of putting CO2 in pipelines and moving it around. So it turns out there is, there is one large-scale use for CO2, and it's for enhanced oil recovery. In fact, right now we're pulling CO2 that's naturally occurring underground, taking it out, <laughs> and, and injecting it into oil fields to help these older depleted oil fields. We put CO2 in there, it changes the viscosity of the oil and frees it up, and you can get a larger production of oil from the well. And, and we, a, a network of pipelines has already been built and established in this country for f taking CO2 from places where it's stored or, or um, naturally found and piping it over to the well. We've got 3,500 miles of CO2 pipeline already in place, so we know how to do this. Um, our, it's a still a relatively new idea, right? Um, not a lot of history. We could go to um, as far back as around 1994. This is, the, this is the best example of geologic sequestration that we have in terms of uh, the time frame. Um, this, is a, this is off the coast of Norway. Um, and this is a, an operation where they're uh, harvesting uh, natural gas. And the natural gas has a lot of CO2 in it. And before it can be saleable natural gas, they have to re separate the carbon dioxide from the natural gas. Uh, and so this is, this is, this is a, actually a common practice. Usually the CO2 is vented after it's separated. But in 92, they were interpreting some new uh, laws that Norway put into place to deal with uh, carbon dioxide and didn't want to pay the, the penalties for letting that carbon dioxide go to the atmosphere. And so they started injecting the CO2 under the seabed in 1994. Uh, and this is uh, some kind of image here. The red and the blue indicates trapped carbon dioxide. You see it, the amount of CO2 increasing and it's sort of spreading a bit. 
Um, it, I believe it's still ongoing. I'm not sure about that. Actually, I have to check. Um, but this was the first successful demonstration of this. Um, and since then, we have, we've, we've started many other demonstrations around the world. One of the, one of the biggest and, and closest ones is over in Illinois, Decatur, I think, yes, Decatur, at the Arthur Mitchell Dan, uh, Arthur ADM, Arthur Daniels Midland plant. It's a corn to, it's an ethanol production plant. And uh, in that process, you inherently, by its nature, get a concentrated stream of CO2. So the Department of Energy came to them and said, let's take your CO2, your, your source of CO2 that you're already producing, and let's study uh, what happens when we put it underground. And so that's been ongoing in Illinois for uh, a couple of years now. Uh, it's been very successful. There's test sites going on all over the world, trying to understand what's the best geology, uh, how fast can we inject the CO2? What happens chemically? There's a lot of research at WashU too going on in terms of what, uh, understanding what happens chemically underground. What's the ultimate fate of the carbon dioxide? So we have a lot of questions, um, but we we feel like we have to find out if this is a viable path or not because if it's a lot is is depending on it. Because if we don't have carbon capture and sequestration we're left with a big hole to fill in terms of um, low carbon energy. Uh, you, you know, I think I'll skip this. Unless ever, you guys really want to know how a power plant works, I think let's, let's skip this. It's sort of, imp it's, uh, I don't think I need it. So we turn to, and I, I want to get into technology just a little bit. You know, how do we actually arrive at this concentrated stream of carbon dioxide, right, in an effective way? Because we know, and there's, there's basically, you'll hear about three different technologies for CO2 capture, okay? And, we call, and the first is called post-combustion CO2 capture. And as the, idea, the concept is simple. We keep the, the power plant is the same. We still have coal burning in air. And we just add on another device at the end of the power plant in like an amine absorption tower that separates the CO2, captures the CO2 from the rest of the flue gas. And, and then here we go, store the CO2, right? We call that post-combustion capture. There's a, a complicated one called IGCC, Integrated Gasification Combined Cycle. And I won't, we don't need to go through the details, but the idea is to take the coal first and then cook it so that and gasify it so it actually turns into what we call a synthetic gas, or, which is like a synthetic natural gas. It's a mixture of CO, carbon monoxide, uh, and hydrogen, okay? That you can, in the right mixture, can act like natural gas. So we have this natural gas, and then we do this. Uh, water gas shift reaction which requires steam and so we, we force all the carbon monoxide to, to fully oxidize go to carbon dioxide okay and we have this concentrated stream of carbon dioxide coming off of that and then we just take the hydrogen burn it in a turbine a gas turbine and away we go the the full-scale a demonstration of this is coming online in Kemper County, Mississippi. Uh, this is a, a technology that Southern Company is, is developing. They have a complex plant where they're actually making other co-products besides electricity. They're also making things like fertilizers. Um, and so it's quite an undertaking. But the, again, there's a, a full-scale example of this coming online. The technology is real. It's not, uh, it's not some fantasy. My expertise is actually in the bottom one, in oxyfuel combustion. And here the idea is, you know, the idea is to deal with the gas separation at the front end of the, of the process. And so, for example, here in the post-combustion process, we were separating the CO2 from the nitrogen at the back end. In the oxy-combustion, we say don't put nitrogen in in the first place. We have an air separation unit that's producing oxygen, and now we're burning coal and oxygen. That gives us carbon dioxide and water, condense the water out, 
Now we've got carbon dioxide. That's the idea. So this, this concept gives us much more flexibility in terms of the power plant design. You can do things like reducing the gas volume, uh, lots of other things. I won't go into too much detail, but this is a very promising approach. The downside, if there is one, is to, you know, it's lower, it's lower cost, higher efficiency. You're committed to fully carbon capture. You're gonna capture all the CO2 from your plant with this process. With this kind of plant, you can choose to capture some of it, right? So if there's, an, there's a regulation out there now that says, you know, if your plant can be, the, uh, have equivalent CO2 emissions to a gas-fired plant, then that's acceptable, right? So you only wanna capture, say, half of the carbon dioxide. You can do that with this kind of approach. Uh, the post-combustion capture is real also. This is a, a new uh, project in Saskatchewan. They took an existing power plant, added the CO2 capture equipment here. Uh, this is capturing one uh, megatons of CO2 per year. Uh, so it's equivalent of 100 megawatts of electricity. Uh, and here the goal was to produce CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. So they're, they're selling the carbon dioxide to an oil company. Um, they've established a pipeline. They're also taking a slipstream of the CO2 and doing some testing on geologic storage as well. Very high cost, $1.3 billion to get this project demonstrated. But again, the technology is real and we're learning about how it works right now at full scale. Uh, this is just a little bit of uh, what the future might look like. So this is a sort of advanced uh, oxy combustion concept that we're working on at Wash U. Uh, just to throw out some numbers of where we might be going in terms of efficiency. The average coal-fired power plant in the U.S. has an efficiency of 32.5% higher heating value, which is pretty pitiful. Our plants are, are not new. Many of them were built in the 70s uh, and are not high efficiency. A, you know, a brand new power plant should be close to 40% efficient. So that's what this number, this, this bar is a new, a new power plant without any carbon capture associated with it. Okay. So first of all, it just shows you if we just replaced our old ones with new ones, that's a lot of CO2 we could be uh, not emitting. Okay. With, with the carbon capture technologies we, 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 that we would deploy right now, today, if there was any incentive to do so, uh, we'd probably take about a 10% hit in our efficiency. That's the reality of where we are today. But if we look at brand new power plants, look at advanced concepts that depend, that go to pressurized oxy combustion, staged oxy combustion, We'll just, just pay attention to this middle one here because that's the apples to apples comparison. We're talking about drastically reducing the penalty associated with, cap with carbon capture according to our, our simulations. So we think we've got a nice technology um, that will lead to much lower cost and high efficiency and the Department of Energy is kindly supporting this, this uh, research at, at Washington University. Uh, so where are we? We've proven technologies at, at uh, me, all of the technologies have been proven at the pilot scale. We just have a couple demonstrations worldwide um, uh, ongoing or planned, but not many. I mean, we wanna see a lot more demonstrations. Uh, the full scale demonstrations are hard because without a price of carbon dioxide, why would anybody wanna invest in such a demonstration plant, right? So that's where we are don't have a reason for investment in large-scale demonstrations. Uh, our coal fleet in the U.S. is old, so my opinion is that retrofitting it for carbon capture is unlikely. Most likely we uh, can continue to retire old plants. We'll have some gas fire generation coming online, and when we get serious about carbon capture, maybe we'll think about building new, new plants around new technology at some time in the future. 20 years plus from now. It's probably what I'm most, I, I had to guess. Um, 
this is from the IEA, and now we're just talking about why CCS is so important. This, from in terms of the IEA and others, um, CCS, carbon capture and sequestration, is going to be 31% of the solution to, to climate change, right? So this, this circle represents all of the stuff we're going to have to do to meet our goals of two degrees C. And everybody's plans, carbon capture and sequestration is a major chunk of that. We're also going to need to build an enormous amount of nuclear plants, bring on a lot of additional hydro, much more wind, much more solar, and you need to do it all. That's the, that's the message. And this is just the Natural Resources Defense Council saying the same thing. This is just in something called a wedge diagram. So now we've got, you know, the, so in other words, this is business as usual. This is where we need to be. And these are all the different technologies we need to get there. Right? So we need improved efficiency. We need renewables. We need geologic storage. You know, notice the size, you know, they're comparable, they're equally important. Uh, improvements in vehicle efficiency, efficient, and et cetera. I know I'm running a little long, so I'm trying to speed through here. I'm almost at the end, I promise. Um, this is the, sort of the, uh, where we're going in terms of implementing all of this stuff, okay? So this is a chart showing per year, gigawatts per year, what we need to do and the pace that we are on, right? So if I say, in order to meet those goals, we need to build 32 nuclear plants a year, I, I believe that's correct, and we're, we're not building any uh, globally, right? Um, we need 14,000 wind turbines a year, and you know we're falling short. So you look at every category, we're falling way short. Okay. Um, and so we, uh, that's not a happy way to end. Uh, I would just say if we, all I'm, I guess my message is if we're serious about this two degree C, if we're serious about really doing something about CO2, it is going to take an enormous. Uh, change in our energy infrastructure, you know, the enormous costs. Um, and so we have to, and if we're gonna do it, we have to get very, very serious about it very quickly. Um, and, and know that uh, the solution is not one, one source, but uh, we're gonna, we need help from all, all low carbon sources. Okay, that's it, I'll stop and take any questions you have. Thanks a lot. Good questions here. Fire away. I'm not trying not to bore anyone, but there we go. Okay. Yes, I'm going to take a sip of water. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, you said um, I think that's mine. about how there was a natural abundance of coal in the U.S., but what about in Asia where they're building all those coal plants? Do they have that same natural abundance, or do they have to get that imported? Um, there is a lot of coal in China. A lot. There's a lot of coal in Australia. A lot of coal in Germany. Um, so the issue in China, I mean, they're, they're using all the coal they have. It's not the best quality, so they do import a lot also from places like Australia, who don't use so, so much coal. Um, but coal is unique. It's one of the what is one of the one of the advantages of coal in that it is spread out fairly uniformly around the globe. So we aren't going to fight wars over coal. Um, like we might and have uh, over other uh, energy sources. Okay, so it's accessible to basically everyone on the planet. I think the exception might be South America. Its reserves are pretty small, but it, it they have good climate and good bio sources and good hydro sources, so they're not as dependent on coal either. Did actually have a quick question. Yeah. I was taking notes as you're talking. Um, you said the, the type of rock that you can put the, the CO2, is it just sandstone or no. anything else? Oh, no. And this is where my ignorance in geology comes in. There's, there's many types of formation, there's many types of geology that this will work. You just need a, you're looking for some kind of porous material. 
And above that, you're looking for something called a cap rock that's very tight. So we think about words like shale, uh, where you know shale, we, we know gas doesn't want to come out of shale. That's why we, we're blowing it up, fracking it now to get natural gas uh, out. You're looking for that kind of geology to act as your cap, your seal, because the CO2 will naturally want to come up. So you need a very non-porous material right above that that porous material to keep it trapped there. Yeah. Or you talk about the fracking, and there's, all, there's articles out there saying that this, this fracking uh, uh, projects uh, are causing, you know, are enhancing earthquakes. Yes. Uh, well, putting the CO2 into the earth yeah. caused something similar. Well, I think um, there hasn't been any evidence of that so far. Um, I think, you know, the, it, it doesn't have to. Pressure has to be managed in the, in the, in the underground. Um, well, they're not doing very well with the fracking. Well, with the fracking, my understanding is that, yes, you can, you can look to some increased, very low-level seismic activity that's been going on and everybody's wondering what's happening so it's an, it's an issue I'm not dismissing the the issue these are not major earthquakes these are not earthquakes that caused any damage we might not want to store co2 next to major fault lines maybe we don't want to do this in California that's probably smart um, but the point is there's a there's a lot going on underground in the oil and gas industry and we have a long history of doing this safely and so, you know, I'm, I'm not too concerned about earthquakes, especially major ones, I'm not concerned at all. Um, and I do think it can be done in a way that, that uh, because we're not, it's, fracking is a little different, it's a much more of a destructive process, right? You're putting a lot of energy down there to get that shale to crack, to fracture and release gases. This is much different. This is just drilling a hole down to the porous material and pumping it in and letting the water come back that's in its way come back up so it's i think it's a less destructive process that should be less prone to these kind of small earthquakes how far do we have to go down well you want to go down as far as you can and get as many of those seals as available to you and you want to get below obviously well below the water table well 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 so we're t usually talking about a mile um, so very very deep yeah. You mentioned that um, if we were to implement some of the spec right now, it would uh, lower the efficiency of coal-fired plants. Is that just because of the extra power needed to separate the yes. CO2 streams? Yes, that's right. There's just a lot of energy required to do that gas separation. So uh, that's exactly right. So in the post-combustion capture approach, you're, you're pulling steam, hot steam off that would normally be going through your turbine and making electricity to, to make that uh, carbon capture work. In the oxy combustion plant, you're using electricity to, or steam to produce oxygen. Um, and so that's the killer right now. Yeah. Yes? Um, is there like anywhere else that um, we can store the carbon? Anywhere else besides underground? Well, that's a good question. I, I haven't thought about that. I think underground's probably the, the, the best place because we need a lot of space. So uh, instead of taking up all of our space on top of the ground, we'll use the space we don't, we don't uh, use, and that's underground. Yeah. Yes, sir. When, when, when you mentioned that they use the CO2, you know, the oil and oil companies use the CO2 to, now is that considered storage or is that just kind of useless? No, it's actually, it's actually storage. So there, there's a lot of research going on in this to determine exactly how much is permanently stored. Some of it does end up in the oil that comes out, but the large majority of the, oil, the CO2 that you're using to extract oil stays, stays in that formation. Stays? Yeah, so that is a form of storage. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah. Are there any other uses for CO2 that 
you know, anything that post combustion, I guess. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, that would be great. But we'd all feel a lot better if we could find something else to do with the CO2 than to put it underground, right? We all, we all feel that way. Um, yes, there are things you could, you could do with it. For example, um, you know, there's going to be a demand probably for renewable fuels, okay, like a, uh, renewable diesel. Uh, and we look to things like uh, algae, maybe as growing algae as a source, a feedstock for these renewable fuels. And algae will be much more productive if you bubble CO2 through their through their uh, ponds. Okay, and so the, the algae take the CO2 and the sunlight, convert that to sugar and grow. Right? They need CO2. They consume CO2. Plants consume CO2. Right? <laughs> so we can use CO2 to grow re renewable fuels, potentially. Right? But that whole scheme is a solar energy scheme at the end of the day. And so it's going to require a lot of a lot of land, a lot of water in the case of algae. But it's if we need renewable fuels, that's one place we can look to put CO2. Right? So plants naturally convert CO2 to something useful, and they use so, uh, renewable energy to do that. We can think of other ways we might even use renewable energy, solar energy, and and design devices. Um, ourselves, right, solar devices to harvest solar energy, put it into CO2, break that, and you're just looking to take one oxygen off and get the carbon monoxide. If you do that, you're home free. You have something useful, okay? But, it, but the whole point is it takes so much energy to do that. You look at the thermodynamics. We got all of this electricity, all this energy because we made CO2, right? It takes just as much energy or or more to put back into that to go the other way, right? So, you know, I sort of feel like these ideas of converting CO2 to other things is sort of a fool's errand. If we could just use solar energy to produce electricity efficiently and not make so much CO2, that's a more direct uh, approach, okay? And we need CO2 for, again, enhanced oil recovery is the biggest market that I know of. Um, we can't make enough soda pop, you know, we'll, we'll try, but eventually, maybe the price of soda will go down, but these markets are going to get saturated very quickly. Um, if we're talking about the amount of CO2 we need to actually impact the climate, that's a lot of CO2. So we'll probably be stuck putting it underground. Yeah. Um, last question. The, the three uh, technologies that you talked about, the carbon capture, mm -hmm. would those um, have any, uh, could they be retrofitted to old power plants, or this is just all new power plants that would replace those? Yeah. They, they are all, well, the post and the oxy are both potential retro retrofit options. So and when you look to... Again, my feeling is here, it's not a probably a great idea, but where you have newer power plants, so say in China, where you have a lot of new power plants, they're already quite efficient. So there the, the pen penalty for putting CO2 goes down because they're already pretty efficient. So yes, we can retrofit existing plants for this, absolutely. The IGCC, the middle one, there's not a many of those plants that have this gasification concept anyway, so uh, that, that would be mostly new builds. Uh, in the middle, the middle case. Yes, sir. So going back to those, you mentioned in the last example um, that you're one of the downsides is you're committed to sequestering all the CO2 that you separate. Uh, why is that compared to the others? Well, because you did the gas separation up front, right? And you have this power plant that's um, producing oxygen. <laughs> and feeding your, your boiler. And so what I'm saying is you, it's all or nothing. You can switch to air anytime you want and capture none. You, your choices are none or, or all of it. You can't, uh, it's not a partial capture. Um, that's just the way that, that, that technology works. But it is, it does, in, in our view, lead to the lowest cost and the highest efficiency of any of the other technologies. 
when you put this under the ground, does the ground get saturated? Saturated, or is it okay? It's enough CO2 in, in the ground. You have to pipe it somewhere. So it, you know, it, it goes underground and then it starts to spread. Okay. So the, so the and it, won't get saturated, or won't well, capacity, whatever you want to call that name. Well, I, I guess um, eventually, as you, as you, the, 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 I would say that I believe the pressure it takes to pump CO two down there increases as the space starts to fill. So as the, as the plume spreads, right, you have more and more rock between the edge of the plume and your injection well, right? So at some point you need more and more energy to get the stuff to keep spreading sideways. It goes sideways, okay? So at some point you stop and you drill another well, right? So you'd be drilling multiple wells moving along so that you don't, you keep the per injection pressure down. Um, and then the idea it will spread and so you're, you need all the tools to monitor the spread of that make sure it's staying contained. Um, I, I hope that helps you visualize what's what's happening. Well, I was thinking um, how many of these wells is going to be needed over, over yeah. some time frame? Yeah, it's an important question and, and that's uh, obviously we're all looking at that very carefully. Um, yeah, you don't just stay in one well, you move around. Just like the, just like the, uh, the fracking that concept does now. They don't stay in one spot very long. Or can you just go deeper? The same spot? Well, you know, the, 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 the storage media will only be so thick. And it has to be that certain, was it the salt or the saline? You're just, it has or to, or right. Has to be There's many layers, you know, over the, you know, many of the glacial periods, you have all these layers of, of, uh, of different uh, types of rock that have formed over the over the many many years, and so the, you know the, the 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 type of material can change kind of drastically once you pass a, a certain depth. So the, it's not the same. You just you don't just keep going deeper and deeper. First of all, it all wants to come up, so the so the depth isn't so important. It's 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 it, it wants to move sideways. You can't just go deeper because it'll just come up again and then spread. It'll come up until it hits the cap rock and then spread sideways. It keeps on spreading until something happens. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, when, you've, when you've filled up the space, you think you, 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 you've laid out, you stop pumping CO2 there. Yeah. What process is used to blow these holes? What process is used to to plug the wells? Um, well, I don't. I'm, I can't say exactly what they what they do. I know, you know, it's it's a well. I mean, you'd be injecting CO two for a long time, but eventually you you plug the well. I don't know what that looks like. It looks a lot like an oil. How you'd plug an oil well or a gas well? I'd imagine. You just gotta. But I don't. I you know. I I can't say that I know for sure how that's done. Yeah. What kind of pressure is underground that you're trying to cap? What's the PSI or anything? Yeah, it's um. Yeah, it's uh. Yeah, it's about a. I'm supposed to know this number. <laughs> I, I want to say it's like a hundred atmospheres. It's very high pressure. Um, that's required because that's just the pressure that's that exists underground. Um, so it's it's high pressure, but it's 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 like I say, it's something weird that's not uh, uh, outrageous. It's it's you know we're we're used to dealing with these kinds of pressures. When you inject it, does it still have the same resistance pressures? It's still 100 atmospheres trying to come back out, or does that just Oh, it, uh, yeah, it would dissipate. It's got a, it's got a, there's a big pressure drop. It would have to get through all of the stuff between here and a mile down. The, the pressure would definitely dissipate. So, you know, what, most of the people I, you know, the experts I talk to, 
nobody's afraid of like you know, like with high pressure or something and then you know somebody something happens in this uh, something the earth opens and then gas comes rushing out with high pressure high velocity that kind of thing just it, it won't happen it can't happen um, we're mo we're much more concerned about the finding the little slow leaks that might happen over over time that might not cause any kind of you know, immediate danger to anybody, but you want to keep the CO2 in there, that's the point. Uh, and you don't want it to be leaking up. And, and so there's a lot of research going on, on on how to set up effective monitoring systems to monitor for potential leaks through through old well. There's a lot of wells that's been drilled from other activities over the years. We gotta go find all these old oil wells and and make sure they're sealed well and plugged so that CO2 doesn't come back up through them. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of issues, a lot of research to be done. Thank you. Let's thank our sponsor. Right, thank you.